just rather than speaking in a thunderous voice from the sky to you or appearing in a burning bush it could like just nudge a microscopic system like some falling coins with the absolute minimum energy input and go okay right oh good look he's doing the ching right what does he need to know right now youthful folly well in this case it's actually not me or you it's a sort of it's some kind of like joint thing that's kind of we've condemned our, our podcast from the beginning in a sense like, it's like well this is just youthful <laughs> this is just foolishness but um your, your assertion that the I Ching might um be a non-stable entity that actually changes when you're not looking at it or you know it appears differently in, as it's time. alive uh, yeah a living thing an outrageous suggestion that could get you locked up in some place some circumstances but but as I said, that there, there, there's similar. I'm sure there are similar claims, or you know, things of a similar order claimed about certain holy books. But in any case, um, that would suggest that the I Ching, the thing that you consult when you consult the I Ching, supposedly it's, it's nudging your coins to tell you that you need hexagram number four right now, or hexagram gram number fifty-two, or whatever. That thing, this I Ching intelligence, would exist outside the. It's, the, it's, called, it's called what? The Ting. The Ting, okay. Yeah, that's a real thing. Is it? <laughs> yeah, in, in, um, I think Wilhelm talks about the Ting. Yeah, the Ting has rings of jade. The Ting has rings of jade. I've just got this image of this kind of I Ching mind enveloping the, the, you know, what we think of as reality, mm. able to both respond to your requests. I'm not suggesting I believe this is going on, but it's like if people who do believe there's something in it, in a sense they are entertaining the idea that there is such a thing so if you believe it's able to answer your requests then why shouldn't it be able to also alter itself yeah so what we, and the people who know it thoroughly and realize this is going on just kind of keep quiet about it or maybe their minds get altered too so they don't notice well i think they just don't like maybe they acknowledge and accept it and just deal with it as that rather than as a book that is always saying the same thing. Do you think there'd be a larger cult of people to claiming, making this claim? Yeah, but the sort of people that the I Ching will reveal itself to, it, you know, is careful about. Oh, uh, okay. In the, it's like an initiatory thing. Wow. So what have we just done? I was thinking when you were saying before that some people would say that the I Ching, um, whatever reading you get is random and it will always be interpretable to suit your question so that's fine it works but it doesn't work by some kind of uh like there's no magic basically that's what some people would say i can't remember how you phrased it but i was thinking that like uh okay so it, they're not like particularly significant to you these readings they're just the random readings that are yeah. completely by chance there's no greater significance to it than that but okay so the only person that experiences that is you and in like the story of your life once you've like lived through it or, um, if if your reading of the I Ching has any influence on your behavior and things like that then it to say that they're random and there's no greater significance to it than that seems almost kind of meaningless because obviously they however those things came to cross your path they are significant they well they become part of the story because they're yeah exactly it's they become interwoven and that, that's sort of through they have a they're imbued culturally, whether it's just your own personal little culture, or you and your friend group, friend group, or the, or you know, massive, you know, like ancient Chinese civilization, that buys into it. It's that which makes you think, oh, maybe this means something, and then you think about things differently, and you act slightly differently, and your life turns out a different way. So, the fact that yeah, this thing has this sort of it sits inside the culture in a certain way or inside your mind, um, but it's it's a different kind of. Um, question than if there's some kind of intelligence pushing a hexagram through from some, you know what I mean, mm. into, into the reading. Mm. In a sense it's been, it's been thought, it's been um, deduced. Or maybe it doesn't need to be, maybe the, the whole metaphor of an intelligent kind of like an I Ching mind sort of doing this is missing the point. Maybe it's more like a mechanism if you believe in sort of karma 
karmic mechanisms that you'd get in Hinduism and some sort of more intricate forms of Buddhism. There's this whole kind of me mechanics of reality that have to do with behaviour patterns and past life stuff. And so, if you if you think that's there, then maybe there are just little tricks that you can do with this mechanism by, like, you know, you create these random processes and this there's this text that reflects something of what's going on, yeah. and that's just built into the, you know, like a trick where you could figure out how to get a free chocolate bar from a vending machine by tapping it in a certain way and you get something um, but it wasn't designed to do that and it doesn't really mean anything it's just something that you can do maybe it's something actually quite mundane if you could view it from a sort of godly enough perspective to use the strange um, adverb or um, adjective do you know about this thing uh, this book called Angel Tech Angel Tech yeah. No, I like the sound of it though. What's going on? The Modern Shaman's Guide to Reality Selection okay. by Antero Ali. Okay, no, it sounds amazing. Guy. Tell me more. I haven't read it. I've read the little bits that Yannick lent it to me and I was looking for it. Angel um, Tech, and the Angel subtitle was the, the Modern Shaman's Guide to Guide Reality to Selection. That's it, yeah. So it's suggesting you can basically just select the reality you want through yeah, magical processes. Yeah, it's got a lot of stuff in it about the teachers and uh, like basically everything is uh, the teacher and you are the teacher and it's constantly changing depending on the situation mm -hmm. it's um it's like all based around him if you do his eight circuit oh, thing. okay um and like, little tricks and or techniques things that you can do on each circuit to um, like get the, the most, um, learn the most from your experience. Okay, so I have to intervene first to apologise for the crackling from the burner, it's just chestnut logs, not some problem with the audio track. Uh, and the other thing was, you mentioned the Leary 8 circuit model, which yeah. not everyone's going to know about. Did, was it, did he do that on his own or was that with Robert Anton Wilson? I think he did it on his own, and then somebody else, maybe the guy that wrote this book, I can't remember, um, like, um, wrote about it afterwards, and then Robert Anton Wilson wrote about what they wrote, so it's become okay. like this uh, thing that's been developed. Right, and it's, it's a model of consciousness, would you say? A model of mind? model of reality? What is, what's it supposed to be? Um, so it's very expressly described as like one model that could be useful sometimes for looking at how your nervous system works right. and it's not like this is the way it is um, and yeah, so it, it's like the eight circuits of your nervous system um, and uh, some of the circuits like the first circuit everything has that's a light that has a nervous system and then I think the second one is maybe all mammals, or maybe reptiles have that as well, I can't remember. And then, like, I think when everyone, every human has the first four circuits, and you can start opening up the others if you want to. Okay, and that would correspond to sort of spiritual development or something yeah. like that? just general development in all directions, well in four specific directions. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I can remember what they all are. The first one is survival, so it's like, is it good if I explain? Yeah, might as well, yeah. I mean, the eight, the eight circuit model of conscious of, the eight circuit model is something worth discussing in the reality report. And I I've, I remember reading about it years ago. I read The, the Politics of Ecstasy, I think. Um, the first Leary book I read maybe 25 years ago, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it was in that, or if not, whichever one it was. And I can't remember anything other than the general sort of idea of a, a kind of map of how, yeah, the self or the mind or... But yeah, the nervous system, that's a more helpful starting point. So the eight circuits of the nervous system, first one being survival, second being... Um, th so the first one, bio-survival, okay. is um, like whether you immediately respond to things positively or negatively. So. On every circuit, you have an imprint that you have, uh, like 
either from birth or then there are like other things that can happen later that change your imprint but very often you're just stuck with one imprint um, apparently women that have children re-imprint at childbirth and you can re-imprint yourself with LSD and probably some other kind of strange practices to do with your mind. So Bleary was advocating careful use of LSD to re-print yourself to create a healthy set of circuits? Yeah, more or less. I guess so. yeah. Right, uh, okay, carry on. And the, So your imprint on the first circuit would either be uh, to like welcome new things and be interested in them or to um, like immediately be afraid of things and feel threatened by it and this is supposedly why breastfeeding is important okay um, to imprint and the second circuit is uh, I can't remember what he calls it but it's to do with um, like whether you where you position yourself in power relationships to other people okay. and so you can either so a negative imprint could be either to think of yourself as the most powerful or the least powerful in any situation and the good imprint is to like, just consider yourself as on an equal level with everybody else now i think you imprint this one when you uh, start like moving around and crawling and stuff like that. Okay, so it comes as part of normal development. Yeah. Right. And then the third one is uh, to do with meaning and like how you, what kind of meaning you assign to things. And you imprint this one as you learn language, uh, but I guess that would probably be earlier than when you start talking because you're already communicating. Mm. Right, let's try just interrupt for a second and try something here so we're going to pause for a moment show you an image of some orchid or something and uh, no we're going to show you a picture of a blanket and the question is how many things can you think of that you can do with a blanket we'll give you what 30 seconds okay, okay so 30 seconds think how many different things can you That's do with a blanket time, actually, yeah. yeah you can pull press pause and go get a pen <laughs> and paper if you want or you can just think of them right and we'll explain why uh, we're doing this momentarily so back in 30 seconds Okay, we're back. So, Juliet, why did we ask people to think of um, things you can do with a blanket? Because it can help you to understand how developed your third circuit is. Um, you know about CQ tests? CQ, it's like, like something like IQ, but yeah, I what, can't what remember what it C? stands for. Right. And it's so a question you'd have on a CQ test is: think of a blanket. How many things could you do with a blanket? And me and Yannick were doing this test on people one night, and um, you get amazing answers from people. Some people can think of loads of things. Some people are really upset that they're being made to think of things to do with a blanket that aren't just sleep under it and keep warm with it. And, like everyone's answers seem to really fit their personalities as well. And um, by the end of it, we were just coming up with ridiculous ones. Like you can use a blanket as a metaphor. You can use a blanket as uh, some something to build a question for a CQ test around. Um, yeah. yeah. And the meaning making circuit is to do with that kind of thing. That it's like what when you see things, what associations, what sort of associations do you make to it, and how do you like where do you fit those things into your kind of understanding of reality? 